Hello, folks. This is Eddie Carson, and you're listening to WJOPLP Newburyport, Jopper Radio 96.3. This is Race Matters, and this is Brother Eddie Carson here talking to you this afternoon about what justice looks like in white spaces. And this is something that I've spoken to white folks about before, and I think it's an, an imperative topic. I think it's even more so imperative for the fact that even before I came over here to the studio here at the Hub, I found myself in a conversation with a couple of white guys, and they're talking about matters of race, matters of affirmative action, matters of things that, well, just all those matters. And then I start really talking about the legacy of Jim Crow. And they looked at me, and they said, what is Jim Crow? And I thought, interesting, right? These are folks who listen to probably a little bit too much Fox News who condemn topics such as critical race theory. And yet, critical race theory reminds and highlights us on the problems of Jim Crow. And Jim Crow is something that all folks should be versed on, all people should be educated on, should know a little bit about the legacy of white supremacy and the policies here in this country. I'm not going to get into the narrative of Jim Crow right now because that's a whole nother lesson. I encourage you to Google it if you don't know what Jim Crow is. Reach out to me if you want to have a conversation about Jim Crow. But it was the institutional policy that defined structural racism and white supremacy in this country, and not just in the Deep South. Jim Crow made its way all the way up here to Massachusetts as well. So today, we're going to talk about what justice looks like in white spaces. That's our topic. And when I think about what justice looks like in white spaces, I remind folks that love is what justice looks like in public. When you love somebody, you make sure people see it and they know it in public. When you go into that voting booth, which is a private matter, much like the intimacy between two people who care about each other, and you cast that vote, folks need to recognize and understand that if I love somebody, I'm going to do them justice by how I vote. So that is it. We think about the problems of the past. We think about matters and issues dealing with Jim Crow. Essentially, we, we know that revolutions are needed in order to make this transformation here in this country necessary. That is just the reality that's there. I'm all about revolutions. Revolutions are the things that allow queer folks to walk down the street with their partners, black and brown folks to engage in public settings, Black, white, brown, indigenous, Asian folks engage in interracial intimacy, both in public and in private. That is what we mean when we talk about love, is what justice looks like in public. When I think about this topic, though, I have to explain and describe things such as how structural racism works. And this is a matter that I've brought to fruition here before. I pontificated in pretty much all kind of narrative and all kind of ways about that. And why do I have to do that? Because it exists, folks. It exists in black spaces. Yeah, it exists in black spaces. Structural racism exists, exists where only black people exist. But it exists in black spaces but only because whites have created such spaces with an exploitive narrative. That sense of domestic and global and international imperialism that has perpetrated even the most hermetically sealed environments that are there. Structural racism exists in white spaces because black people did not, nor, yeah, black people didn't create it, nor did they build systems of structural racism. Black people cannot build these structures within the American confines of structural racism. You know, folks, I'm talking about white folks here. I'm talking to you, my white listeners. You did not build these systems. You didn't build elements of structural racism. Those things were ingrained in a constitution and a fabric of the American narrative that has essentially permeated the history of this country for a very long time. However, I will say, you are a cog in this system. You're a cog in a capitalist structure that's not broken. Structural racism under, premise, under the premises, under the guise 
of what exists today has always been here. The system essentially was designed this way. And it has long been one of those elements that continues to exist for a long period of time. Now, right, think about this idea about the myth of the end of racism that took place in 1964 with the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Those legislative acts convinced too many folks that racism is not real and people like you, Eddie, need to stop talking about racism because it no longer exists. That's a falsity, folks. That's a pipe dream, right? On the premise of capitalism, those things are going to continue because people have their own self-interest at stake, and there's not enough radical love to drive those changes that are needed. Black nor white folks want to talk about structural racism at times. That's right. I'm talking about both folks are not binary racial lens, but I can extend it beyond the binary to Asian folks, indigenous folks, right, to all kind of folks who want to continue to believe that this is an imaginary interpretation of the past that does not happen nor function here in the 20th century. So if black nor white folks want to talk about structural racism, but to have justice, folks, right, in order to have justice in white spaces. And I'm talking to two white communities here. I'm talking to Newburyport. I'm talking to any place where there is a persistent and a consistent narrative of occupation of white folks. We need to talk about and we need to fix the problem of race within our own communities. The world is big, but it's a creation started in our own backyard. There are black folks who see structural racism as, I don't know, getting in a way. And the problem with structural racism getting in the way is it creates a barrier and not an artificial barrier, not that wall that Trump wanted to build in order to keep folks out. Another example of structural racism right there. But it exists that allows us not to have the kind of conversation nor engage in the type of talks that are really going to advance humanity. And I'm talking about humanism here. Let us just pretend it is not there. Right. Let's just let's just pretend it doesn't exist. I wish I had understood structural racism when I was in the sixth grade. That would have been great. It would have really explained a couple things when I met a a white child and engaged in an interracial friendship and an interracial relationship with them, only to find out decades later that their parents didn't want them to have a relationship with me because of the color of my skin. I remember hearing about this and feeling heartbroken, trying to understand why this this awesome white sister who was a friend of mine couldn't go to the movie theater with with me or my brother because of what we look like. I wish I had a, a different kind of understanding about it when I was in high school. When I was in high school, right, I thought about race. I was reading about race, but I also operated in this imaginary sense that maybe, just maybe, we will eradicate it slowly. It will dissipate into the abyss of the unknown in ways that allows us to collude in ways in which we can really show that bonding. But yet, back then, that's when I was a little bit more optimistic. Folks at my age right now, and I'm not an old man, I'm not there, but yet I'm not a young man either. And because of that, I actually thought those things would have disappeared by now. And so I'm a realist. I'm not a pessimist. I'm hopeful, but I'm not optimistic. And essentially, that was born out of the fact that those things will continue, and they have continued. I'm me because I have dedicated myself to speaking a level of truth that so many avoid just because they want to be liked. It's not a popularity contest. Being an anti-racist and eradicating the vestiges of white supremacy and racism is not about popularity. It's all about doing what's right and doing what's good. You see, folks, you're going to like me because what I say is true. We don't have to agree with everything, but there's a lot of truth in terms of the narrative and the message that I have. And while it might feel like a condemnation, and condemnation is not a bad thing, I'm not calling you out. I'm just merely inviting you in, making you aware as I do every week that these things do exist. And those are the things that we have to navigate. I say what I have to say because I'm inviting you into a radical space of immediate action. That immediate action may look like the bond, the closeness, the friendship, how we engage, how I hang out with this awesome white sister who's outside the studio right now making sure that I don't say anything too radical, but who applauds all the radical things that I have to say. 
those are the things that are necessary. <coughs> so for us, I think we have to grasp this notion of justice in order to understand this element of white spaces. To grasp justice in white spaces, we have to understand what injustice is. You can't understand justice without really delving into the notion of injustice. Let us start with the elephant in the room. Structural racism, that's the elephant. Structural racism, which in the United States is the normalization and legalization of an array of dynamic, historical, cultural, institutional, and interpersonal elements that routinely advantages white folks over people of color, particularly BIPOC folks, BIPOC being black indigenous people of color. Let me give you some examples. We've continued to see for a long period of time the inequities of things such as housing. Now, I bring this up quite a bit. Whether it's housing in communities such as Newburyport, housing in Boston, housing in Amesbury, housing in Boston, those things have really created a rift in which you can't love somebody because they're not your neighbor. And oftentimes people are not your neighbor because they can't afford to be your neighbor. Folks may not have to be as radical as that Unitarian Universalist white brother by the name of James Reeb, who took his entire white family, his white wife, his white kids, and moved them into a black community in Boston. And one of the things he said is you can't get to know somebody and you can't get to love them if you're not in proximity to them. And that proximity really elicit notions of radical love. We see elements of structural racism when we think about education. We continue to understand, or maybe we don't understand, this school-to-prison pipeline. White implicit biases, and that white implicit biases really reflect teaching. It reflects things such as standardized testing. It reflects the things that really create that barrier that divides us racially. The things that we have to tear down and disavow. We look at prison systems, we look at discipline systems within schools and institutions and how we penalize folks. Those are some of the things that are there. You know, we think about structural racism in, in the greater Boston area, we look at wealth disparities and inequities and inequalities that are there. So let's, 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 let's talk about that for a second. You know, I, I always reference when I go back to the Boston Spotlight series, that or the Spotlight series, that the Boston Globe did back in, I think, like 2017, I believe. And one of the things that they noted is that white wealth in the greater Boston area is enormous. White income, they're not income, white wealth per household is roughly around $250,000 to that of $8 for black folks, $8. And this really brings into account income. This brings into account home ownership. This brings into account all the elements that generational wealth has allotted and allowed for some folks on one part of the color line over other folks. Those things, those disparities, right, within income and housing promote crime. And people want to always talk about crime. And they talk about crime as if it's a blame game. Crime is horrible. Crime brings down community. Crime is demoralizing. But yet, sometimes some folks commit wrongful acts of criminality because of the disparities that exist. Blacks are in prison. To give you an example, blacks are imprisoned. Or better yet, let's just use the right word. They're incarcerated at a rate of 2,300 for every 100,000 people. It is enormous, especially seeing that black folks only represent roughly around, I believe, 13.4% of the American populace as we know it. On the other hand, right, think about that number, 2,300 for every 100,000 black folks are incarcerated. On the other hand, whites are incarcerated at a rate of 450 450 people per 100,000, right? Huge disparity there. Huh. Folks, in, 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 in Massachusetts and other states, marijuana, 
or marijuana, if you want to try to spell it out phonetically, because I have to break it down, because that's a word that I can't spell, to be honest with you. My 10th grade English teacher will attest to that. It's, um, it's, it's criminal that you have a, a billion-dollar industry, and yet you still have people serving time for just a little bit of marijuana, right? Those things really continue to exist. And not only do they continue to exist, but then equity and it is the discrepancy in terms of how it's reflected among the black population versus other racial demographics, and I should say the black and brown population, is true. It is a fact and it's a reality. These are the hard facts that exist not only nationally, but of course here in our own communities as we pointed out too. Folks are like, but Brother Carson, come on. We do not have structural racism here in my community. We don't have, bro we don't have structural racism in Boston. We don't have structural racism in Newburyport. There are no black folks here. My response to something like that is it looks in many ways, I don't know. Thank you for making my point. All right, we don't have black folks here. We can't have structural racism. All right, you just made my point. Why is that the case? All right, why aren't there black folks living in your hood, living in your neighborhoods? Why oftentimes if I go out to dinner, most likely I'm going to be the only one sitting there having a drink, enjoying my meal, hanging out with good friends like the sister right out here who's kind of keeping an eye on me. Those are some of the elements that we must continue to think about. White communities are complicit because, and then I say that, white communities are complicit because they have often and inadvertently supported an exclusionary system of injustice, not doing enough radical things to bring about some of the changes that are necessary. That may mean voting for folks who are really radical, voting and supporting folks who are going to say that we are only going to support banks and businesses and other industries and vendors who are going to allow us to narrow that, that margin, that margin that's divided by the color line. All too often people dismiss what I'm saying because they believe the answer is building a race-neutral society. Let's just not see race. And we've seen what that's gotten us here in the 21st century. We call that colorblind ideology. And there are a lot of folks, black and white. <laughs> Did y'all see Herschel Walker recently? There's a reason why black folks didn't vote for him. You see his, um, his, 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 his rallies and his, his post-election defeat, and you looked at the spaces, there weren't really a whole lot of black folks congregating there because they're not gonna support colorblind ideology because they're fully aware of what that means and what that looks like. And in white spaces, notions of colorblindness can't continue to be allowed, nor should they exist. Only the absence of accounting for race will bring racial equality. Reject all racial categorization is what people would say. Reject record keeping and make no distinctions based off race. And that's how we're going to fully achieve the real American dream. That's how we're going to get to a place that is colorblind, race neutral, the absence of all those things. And when I hear that messaging, I say baloney, right? I, and I tend to call those things out quite a bit because... It doesn't work that way. Research has shown the first thing you notice when someone walks into a room is the color of their skin. It really is. Now, maybe if they walk in and they have wildly funky pink and beautiful green hair that express their identity, you may notice that first, but then you're going to go to other aspects, particularly the color of their skin. This assumes that racial harkies, right, if we're thinking about colorblind ideology, Racial harkies do not already exist. The problem is those racial harkies do exist. When we think about structural racism, we're thinking about things like hiring discrimination, limited opportunities, the inability to network and connect to other people who have means and wealth and power in a way that allows others to be invited or at least to push down a door to enter into different spaces. That's what structural racism is colorblind ideology will point the finger at things such as, well, <laughs> Eddie, let me tell you, these problems exist because one, there's a behavior issue with black people. 
If you've seen their videos, have you seen the way they act? And I'll admit, right? I'm, I'm going to come out and say this because I'm, I'm a blues man. I'm a jazz brother. I know what I like to listen to. And there's sometimes I'll sit there and I, you're right. I'll watch some videos and I'll sit there and I'll think, man, come on. This one brother doesn't represent the entire race. Because, see, to make an assumption that my behavior is predicated on the behavior of someone on the TV set is racist in and of itself. And those are the things that subconsciously penetrates our mind when we think about behavior, when we think about culture, when we think about discipline, we think about those things. There's this academic, this sociologist at Harvard by the name of Lawrence Bobo. And Lawrence Bobo did this study. And here's what Lawrence Bobo concluded. When will, when will racism end is the thing that he was trying to address in his study. He noted some interesting points that I think we got to keep in mind here. Case in point would be 61% of white people, okay? And I want you to pay attention to these numbers here. All right, I think it's really important here, okay? All right? Listen to these numbers. 61%, according to a study, of white people already believe that we have achieved racial equity and justice, and we live in a world that is absent of racism. 61% in sense believe that there is no more racism. 61% of white folks. Another 20% of white folks believe it is on a horizon. We're at the, we're at the edge. We're almost there. We're, we're going to get there. Maybe we can get there if we talk, stop talking about race and racism. That, that's a possibility that's there, too. That's 20%, right? So now, essentially, we're saying that 81% of white folks essentially believe that racism is on a verge of being eradicated or has already been eradicated. And this is here in the 21st century here. There are black folks who believe otherwise, too. 17%, of course, of blacks believe that we have also reached some level of race neutralness. That's when you get into the class orientation into other types of wealth disparities that really comprise and make up the, the black middle class. But the reality is most black folks don't believe it's there. You talk to black folks and they'll tell you a long way away from that. You talk to black folks and they tell you that racism it's not a continuity, but it's an end. It's already met a death-defying concealment that will not persist because we've gone through the 80s and we've seen interracial shows back to the 60s where Brother King gave some kind of speech that no one can name that speech, right? No one can really even tell you anything about that, brother, especially with January coming up, and I'll say more about that on a later show, how we'll start seeing social media posts and all people talking about radical love and how this is the promised land. We should just listen to Brother King. He said we should judge folks based off the content of their character, not the color of their skin. But yet, in actuality, we do judge people, regardless of what we know about folks, based off the color of their skin. If justice is what love looks like in public— then how do we convince that 81% of whites that justice in white spaces is not the denial of institutional structures that further the continuity of racial disparities? How do we do that? You know, and part of the things I try to do on this show, and I try to bring up these topics, not to upset folks, not to get people bent out of shape thinking, oh, I can't do Eddie Carson anymore, race matters, it's just... It's just too much for me. I just want to talk about happy stuff. I just want to not think about race because white people don't have to think about weight, don't have to think about race. White people get up in the morning and when they travel up to rural white communities in New Hampshire and Maine, when they have to pull over and get gas, when they want to get a little bite to eat or they're looking for a hotel, they don't have to think about those things in terms of will I be discriminated against? Will there be any type of mental or bodily harm brought to my attention because of the way I look? Folks don't have to think about that. When I travel, I have to map out my routes. I have to map out where I'm going to stay. I have to ask myself, will I be safe today? 
when a truck gets behind me for a long period of time and makes all kind of turns, when I'm in some rural area where there are no there there are there are very few people who look like me, most likely there are no folks who look like me. I have to raise an eyebrow and I have to look at look with a level of suspicion that's there. Some people would say, Oh brother, that's just being paranoid. I say no, that's just being black. The movie The Green Book. Oh, I'm sure many folks saw The Green Book and that made you feel good. The Green Book was a reality in which we go back to the 1950s and the 60s when black people wanted to travel. They had to map out every course and every route in order to feel some semblance of safety and protection. If it wasn't even small things like being on a highway and having to pull off to the side and go into the woods just to take a potty break, as I tell my dog Baxter, who oftentimes need potty breaks. It's not, well, we'll just find the next gas station or the next restaurant, right? Folks are like, well, Eddie, this is the 21st century. Those attitudes and behaviors no longer exist. And I'm here to tell you that those things do exist. I'm here to tell you that those things are the modern day realities that never ended because a brother gave a speech and signed a little legislation back in 1965. I'm here to tell you here in the year 2022 that that narrative of continuity continues to persist only because we live in a society where 81% of white folks and white communities believe that we're on the cusp of ending racism, or as that 60% said within that 81% that it no longer exists. We've eradicated that because a brother gave a talk. Between 1994, going back to Lawrence Bobo, that sociologist at Harvard, between 1994 and 2008, roughly 75% of whites stated that blacks should just overcome racial prejudice and racism. Think about that number. 75% essentially stated that if black people stopped talking about race, if black people just operated from, from, from a lens that it no longer exists, then we would probably overcome our racial prejudice, bigotry, and our practices of white supremacy. And yet, here we are putting it all back on black folks. When George Floyd died in 2020, the emails and the phone calls came in saying, brother, what can I do? But then I would give them some advice. I would tell them what they can do. And their response, more often than none, was, huh, you're asking a little bit too much from me. I, I, I can't do that. That's just not a reality. You're asking a lot for me to help you overcome racial bigotry, bigotry, prejudice, and white supremacy. Now, you've heard me say this before. I love Brother Barack Obama. I, I do. I, 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 I like him. I like Michelle a little bit more, but I love, I love Brother Barack. White liberals, and I like talking about white liberals, white liberals loved him enough to showcase, that their, showcase their vote for him to prove that they were not a part of this cog of structural racism, all right? Those same white folks ran out and bought books, put their Black Lives Matter signs in their front yard, really protesting racial injustices. And yet, not even a year later, a lot of those same white folks are crying out the problem of talking about critical race theory and structural racism and how these things make people feel bad for being white and their inability to advance and move beyond that. It doesn't happen like that. See, that is the lie of white liberalism, folks. Obama's obsession with all that lift all boots approach ignored the gravitas of the anchors holding communities of color down. And I would say that was probably one of his big flaws, right? Just lift all boats, we'll navigate, we'll move. When he was running for the Senate back in 2004, we heard that great speech at the Democratic National Convention where he said, I don't see red states, I don't see blue states, I only see purple states. And us talking about race in this way is not going to help. And hence, his apprehension to really to, to address that, I, I will be the first to say, was problematic in many ways. For white folks or non-people of color, you must understand that if you're struggling with what I'm saying, then you are entitled to an opinion, and that's okay, and I'll give you that. And while you're entitled to an opinion, 
it does not make you informed, nor does it make your opinion the correct opinion whatsoever. Do not allow others to use their reactions as a way out, right? You can't do that. Justice in white space is white people not seeing themselves as unique and unaffected by the culture we live and exist in today. Because we know white supremacy, white racism, racism in general, it doesn't hurt just black and brown and Asian folks, right? Particularly with the manifestation of anti-Asian behavior and Asian hate that's continued to promulgate uh, in so many areas. Uh, that's not the issue whatsoever. What we know, of course, is the fact that if we want to think about justice in our communities, we have to really pause, take a look and evaluate what do relationships look like with other folks. Justice in white space is white people not seeing themselves in a fact that not only are they not unique, but also moving away from this notion that everything is normative, everything is average, Everything is the way they should be because I don't have to think about the color of my skin until someone brings it up in a talk such as the one I'm giving right now or a lecture I'm giving or a conversation I may be having at the coffee shop, right? White folks need to wake up daily and be aware that there is privilege in being white. People will say, well, brother, I didn't come from a lot of wealth and I don't have a lot of privilege. Nope, you may not, but... I guarantee you, when you get ready to get on the road and you get ready to head out, you do not have to think about the dimensions that define who you are from a racial lens and thinking about that in the most categorical way. See, ignoring the systemic dimensions of racism is the problem. And a key word that I want to illuminate for you is ignoring. Here's how great it is to be white. White people, right? And I want you to think about this. And I can't remember the name of the comedian, but I want to give you a quote that this comedian once made because I thought it was profound, right? How great is it to be white? White people can get in a time machine and they can go to any time in any place and it would be probably one of the most awesome experiences that they've ever had. They can talk about these things all the time. What would it be like to go back in time? A black person or any other person of color in time machines is likely to say, well, you know what? I like to get in the time machine, but I'm not sure I'm willing to go too far back in time. I may pause maybe at, say, 1980. And even pausing at 1980 will bring a little bit of pause, hesitation, and concern there, too. So what can you do? What can white people do? What can we do in an interracial fabric? Because I'm all, if you know me, I'm all about interracialness. I love the fact that when we cross that color line and we engage in the most prophetic conversations, whether it's around dinner, a nice meal, an adult beverage, um, a sermon, right, congregating in churches, we can do a lot. First, you must start at the individual level. Everything starts at the individual level. It's about the self. It's about, you know, what can, the, what can I do as an individual? I know of the great anti-racist work that many white folks are doing, and I applaud you for that. Continue to do that anti-racist work. It is what I want to partner with many of you in thinking about how we remove the vestiges of structural racism and white supremacy. I once made a list of the things I like about white spaces and how the narrative of whiteness has shaped me in the most ubiquitous ways. Whiteness is average, normal, exceptional, Whiteness is preferred. That behavior has to be changed in order to really address some of the elements that have to take place. I thought about the books I was always asked to read growing up, right? And thinking about the, the diversity and the multiplexity of those books and how those things really take a, a far stretch. I ask you to pause and look around your home and ask yourself, do I have books in my library, on my shelves, in my living room, in my dining room that represent folks who do not look like me? Do I watch television shows that, that represent other people beyond the notion of whiteness? And I'm not talking about the shows that are predicated on whiteness with one or two tokenized black folks either. I'm talking about shows that really usher in a better understanding of black identity and black culture and black behavior. My wife and I, we once visited the 
Sistine Chapel. We we're in there and we we're looking at the ceiling and viewed the creation of Adam. Uh, if you know me as a historian, as a person who admires art and culture and history, I have a deep admiration for those things. This biblical imagery told the story not so much of Genesis in the Christian Bible. Well, actually, I would say Genesis is not in the Christian Bible, but <laughs> because Muslims and Jews look at it too. But thinking about the 16th century narrative of Genesis in that way holds some element of truth today. And that is this. Whiteness is the standard by which all things beautiful, sophisticated, cultural, and intellectual should be compared to. These are the things that we've created this canon uh, about. And that's true for even books. And don't get me wrong, right? I'm okay with the canon, but the canon has to be inclusive. It can't be all about the white European narrative of society and culture and sophistication and advancement without being aware of some of the great art, the great literature, and the great works created by people of color. <laughs> Hallmark does a really good job of this. You ever watch a Hallmark show? Hallmark is really interesting because Hallmark always paints this ideal community, this ideal society, the ideal couple, and they're always white, right? And there's some generalizations made here. I'll own that. But for the most part, they're always white. They're always straight. They're always affluent. They always live in the most idyllic scenery and idyllic home and idyllic community. That always is, is the idea of Hallmark. The idea of couples being white and straight is what the American dream looks like, right? That nice big house, the sprawling lawns and the picket fences that exist and the dog that run around and greet the little kid when they get off the yellow school bus in the afternoon. Some people will say, well, the most ideal communities are always white, right? I mean, I'm convinced every Hallmark show is made in probably Vermont. I don't know. I'm not in Vermont. I'll go up there from time to time, particularly to go skiing or maybe get a little maple syrup. Make another list of your community and ask yourself, how my elements of structural racism exist in my community, right? That's just an exercise for you. Brainstorm those things. And then if you get to a point where you only come up with two, three, four things, that's okay. Why don't you examine those two, three, four things? That's a great start. And reach out to me, and then we can continue that list. We can finish that list. How might you, my dear white listeners, be supporting such systems of existence. When I think about white spaces, I want to come back to where I started, and that is with Brother Martin Luther King Jr. That brother saw no visible hand that coordinated the self-interest of whites with the interest of blacks. He saw instead a system that brutalized black fathers, black mothers, and black children through an unchallenged system that empowered the white majority to enforce unjust laws on people of color. So remember, he pointed these things out, but no one's going to talk about that come January when we start plastering and posting all these things on social media about Brother King because that's a bit too radical. King once wrote, and I want to quote this here so I get it right. I quote, Superficial solutions and shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. That, my friends, is part of the centrality of the message of Brother King. Brother King, much like myself, or better yet, I should say, I like Brother King, like to profess radical love and talk about radical love all the time. Radical love sits at the center of a radical brother like Martin Luther King, a man who, uh, who has been essentially sanitized, deodorized, perfumed, overly cleansed since his death in 1968, almost to a fact that we don't even recognize what his message was really about because we had to sanitize him so much in order for it to be palatable for our taste bud, for our intellectual curiosity, for our own sense of self and our own self-esteem, giving us an excuse to make excuses about our own inaction and the injustices our inactions continue to commit. King was a man often forgotten for being a radical and how he loved. And this is particularly true in white spaces. Until one day each year, 
in January, we go back to him. And then we forget about him for the rest of the year. While society has deodorized and misappropriated Brother Martin, turned him into a mere social media meme and a pulpit commentator, I am here to offer a bit of truth to what made him a radical, particularly what should make him a radical in white spaces, how he loved, right? I think that's the most important thing to keep in mind because we always got to start with love. And you got to behave in a certain way because somebody loved you. I got a mother and a father, and they loved me. King was radical. And while he is just a mere line in a textbook, it seems, and let me remind you that when we went to the mountaintop on the eve of his death in 1968, and hopefully you caught that reference, right? The last talk that brother gave down in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968 before he was brutally executed, murdered, was I've gone to the mountaintop. I've seen the glory of the land. Hallelujah, right? He, he's been there. He's been there. And yet he's saying that. And I want to give you some other numbers to ponder, not to ponder, okay, but to, 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 to ponder, to, to think about. Because when he came down from the mountaintop on the eve of his death in 1968 in white spaces, 72% of white folks disapproved of him and his actions and his messages. And that probably sounds very familiar in terms of the commonality, the narratives that exist today. But shoot, right? Even 55% of black folks disapproved of him. Many of those black folks, those burgeoning middle-class bourgeois folks who went to segregated schools, historically black colleges and university, and even those who are lucky enough to go to integrated white institutions, gain themselves a little bit more of an income in middle-class status. And they're like, well, that brother King was too radical. I'm tired of listening to him. All right. And if I don't have to listen to him, white folks in certain communities don't have to listen to him whatsoever. Those are the things that are there, too. So because his message was so radical, was too much for the comforts of those living a life of complacency, that brother essentially was assassinated. And I don't mean, and he was literally assassinated, but he was assassinated in the sense that we're going to change the profoundness and the radicalness of his message. We know that black folks had problems with the capitalist part. We know that folks disavowed his messaging that oftentimes made him so unpopular on the eve of his death only to see him die and be read birth in this notion of popularity in which we change the tone and the narrative of what that looked like. And that takes place in white spaces. White people, if you want to educate yourself a little bit more, read a little bit about the true radical brother King and what his messages were all about, right? Folks, you're listening to Eddie Carson here at Race Matters. You're listening to WJOPLP Newburyport, Joppa Radio 96.3. You can catch this show on the Hub's website. You can catch this show on my website. All right, I've posted those on my website, ProfessorCarson.com, and you can go back and see some other stuff. I advise you to start from the beginning and work your way all the way down and use that as a means to educate yourself, to inform yourself about how you can disavow the problem of whiteness in white spaces and how oftentimes people of color and people who look like me have been pushed to the margins in these spaces because, huh, because of the belief of white or solely white identity and colorblind ideology. You know, the major intellectual and practical challenges that that brother King once um, created for us was that of his critique of society. His critique of society oftentimes followed his belief in radical love. And radical love was a moral and practical method for him, as it is a more and practical method for myself and is and should be for you, too. It is why we have congregated at this point right now. It's why we're doing what we're doing. It's why you're listening. Hopefully, you're going to do this thing not to disengage huh, or check off a box, 
or to claim that I listened to Brother Carson just for a little bit, so I feel I feel a little bit better about myself and I'm okay. I I can move on forward. King's radical love followed Gundy and that radical gay black brother by the name of Bayard Rustin and many other wonderful black women and black queer folks and yes, even those awesome white folks who walk side by side with him to bring about the changes that are needed. Brothers like James Reeb, who I mentioned early on, who packed up his whole family, moved him into a black neighborhood. They weren't looking to run. They weren't looking to escape the busing in Boston and head up to Newburyport or Bell Recca. I think that's how folks around here pronounce the name of that town. Uh, I seem to butcher towns up here more than anything else. I think those things are the necessities that must happen. Amidst all of these things, amidst global and domestic racial struggles in the name of injustices that exist, King professed this message. And that message, of course, is going to continue to do the things that need to happen. Remember, here in the USA, the KKK used the cross at one point to practice hate and bigotry in the name of Jesus. We saw white preachers continue to do that. And yet King came in that Christian Protestant narrative that he professed took the cross from white supremacy and brought it back to a central place in which all folks along the color line could congregate in ways that are necessary. I think these are the things that we have to keep in mind too. I tell you what, when I think about things and notions that must happen, I think about the classic argument that I just don't know where to start, Eddie. Well, listen to what I have to say and listen to what I've said. Watch it again and watch it again. And then give me a call and I'll help you move uh, in different directions that are there. Folks, I appreciate your time here another week as we think about radical love, as we think about race matters, as we think about what justice looks like in public, what justice looks like in white spaces. And those things are all about people committing themselves to disavow those thoughts and images in their mind. Even those that are presented when people claim colorblind ideology and finding ways to reconcile the challenges, not only in our communities, but Huh. within your own household, within your own home. What are you going to do, folks? What are you going to do? What do you want me to do? Not much I can do if you're not willing to lift that finger and say that I'm going to turn it, I'm going to point it at myself, and I'm not going to point it at other communities. I'm not going to point it at the racism of Donald Trump. I'm not going to point it at the racism of David Duke. I'm not going to point the finger at those folks because we know how they're complicit. I think you have to point the finger at yourself and say, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to start by creating a list, by brainstorming a list of what those injustices look like. And even if I only come up with three or four things, I'm going to reach out to Brother Carson. And I'm going to say, come help me finish that list. But yet, while I may only come up with three or four things, huh, I'm going to attack those three or four things. And that's all folks can ask. Shoot. Even if you only come up with one thing, that's one step forward. Folks, thanks for listening to me, Eddie Carson here at Race Matters. You're listening to WJOPLP Newburyport, Joppa Radio 96.3, bringing you another prophetic message under the notion of radical love and truth. Y'all be well. Happy holidays. Don't eat too much. I'm talking primarily to myself right there. All right, put the eggnog down after a while. Oh, I'm talking to myself again. Be well.